your children bring to join your praise. You are the great high priest. You have prepared the feast of holy Our mortal pain, none calls on you in vain. Our plea, do not disdain help from above. Oh, ever be our guide, our shepherd and our pride, our staff and soul. Jesus, oh Christ. By your enduring word, lead us where you have trod, make our faith strong. Good evening. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's good to be back. We were not here, Carol and I, last week. We were on vacation in south of Miami. It's great. What did we do? Practically nothing. That's why it was great. Uh, well, we did snorkeling. Anyway, it's great. But it's great to be back. Good to be back. Good vacation. Uh, we're here tonight. Jesus risen from the dead with us. The, this, every fourth Sunday after Easter, which is what this is, the lessons are always from John 10, where Jesus talks extensively about himself as the good shepherd. And so it will be tonight as well. May we are his flock fall into his arms. What do you need that? What do you need? Forgiveness? Fall into his arms for it. Guidance? Just his love? Just assurance? Wh whatever it is. Let him be everything to you. His sh the shepherd. And hear his word and let him be that for you. You say, I don't deserve it. He knows that. <laughs> he's, he's not for you anyway. Let him be your shepherd. We make our beginning now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So if we say we have no sin, as if we deserve everything, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And let's kneel and offload those sins. <laughs> Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. of 
The epistle today is from 1 John, the third chapter. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whatever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments, and we do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit who, he am, who has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is hired a hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they also listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You called your Son our Father. You called his name. And ears, once dead, hearken to your voice. He rose. And now our shepherd lives. Now our shepherd calls us. Ears, once deafened by this world's clatter, Hearken to the calling of our own names. Grant that we, will, we may not know, only hear the calling of our shepherd. But listen. Not only listen. But follow. Then we will do our shepherd's bidding. To rescue the lost sheep. To, to heal the injured lambs. And to lead your flock to green pastures of knowledge. To still waters of understanding. Make your sheep shepherds through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Grace and mercy and peace to you from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat>
In, uh, in John chapter 10, tonight's reading taken from that, Jesus clearly identifies himself with the great shepherd that we read about in the Old Testament. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus says, that's me. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd is the one who takes us to still waters, to calm places. That's what the shepherd is. The shepherd is the one who restores our weary, aching hearts. Now, be clear, clear about this. A shepherd is someone who takes care of everything. A, a, a shepherd isn't a partner, okay? A shepherd is not someone that you enter into a partnership with and he does some of it and you do some of it. That's not a shepherd. A shepherd does everything. A shepherd is somebody who takes care of you, somebody that you put yourself in his arms and he says, don't think about another thing. I've got everything under control. Relax. No worries. That's what a shepherd is to sheep. And I challenge you to consider that everybody here in this place tonight has been looking for that shepherd. A lot of us have gotten married or have sought to get married to somebody and have thought, Finally, finally, this is the person who will take care of me. This is the person who will meet all my needs. This is the person so that at last I can relax. This is the person who will give him or herself completely to me and take care of everything. And surprise, they can't do it. Some of us are upset because we thought our parents were supposed to be our shepherds. We thought our parents were the people who should take care of us completely, take care of all our problems, all of our needs, always be there giving himself or herself, always be for us. And surprise, they couldn't do it. Consider where else you might look. You've been looking for friends, say. Or you've gotten a job working for people. Or you've voted in leaders thinking, this is the one who will take care of everything. This is the one who's finally going to take care of me. Sometimes you can go to a doctor like that. This is the one. They're so qualified, so capable, everything's going to be fine. As a pastor, sometimes I've had people approach me like that. They think that if they can just tell me about whatever it is, I can see it in their eyes, that they think that they'll, then they'll have no more troubles. I'll take care of everything. Surprise. Now, I bet I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, yeah, yeah, I've got friends like that. They're always looking for somebody to take care of them. But that's not me. I'm emotionally mature. I'm well-adjusted. I, I know that there isn't anybody who's going to take care of me like that. Ah, uh, no you don't. No you don't. Because if you've decided that you don't look to anybody else, then who is your shepherd? You. You are. You've decided that you're qualified to be your own shepherd. And that's ridiculous. Now admittedly, you may have achievements, and you might very well behave in a more capable fashion uh, compared to some other people. Great, congratulations on that. Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is that everybody here, until they recognize that they need a shepherd and that no human being besides Jesus can be that shepherd, until then, you're always going to be restless, always going to be unhappy. In fact, the major key to understanding your life so far is that you've been searching for the shepherd. And what does Jesus say here? It's me. <laughs> I'm the shepherd you've been looking for. Nothing can fulfill you like I can. I am the one you seek. And the issue is, is he really? Can he do it? What do you believe? 
Some of you are saying, well, what do I believe? Well, for sure. He, yeah, he's the shepherd. Jesus is, is, is my shepherd. Huh. Well, so you say, but American Christian philosopher Dallas Willard remarked that the Lord is my shepherd is written on more tombstones than lives. See, it's not just your say-so, but it's, it's in how you live that you will seek to be shepherded by someone or something, even if it's yourself. The question is, Jesus, in actual fact, and will you actually depend on, look to, etc., etc., is he the true shepherd? Not just lyric in a song, but the true shepherd for you. In verse 11, the beginning of our reading, the first and main thing that Jesus points to is his total commitment to the sheep. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then immediately he contrasts himself with other shepherds. In verse 12 he says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The hired hand runs for his life, leaving the sheep. Do you condemn him for that? That's a bit hasty. Because the hired hand is simply, folks, the hired hand is simply behaving normally in an expected, sensible way. I dare say, as you or I would. His relationship with the sheep is what is technically called transactional. That is, it revolves around a sense of the costs and the benefits. For sure, the hired man will watch the sheep, even do a good job of it in exchange for wages. Is that unfair? And certainly will not do it at the cost of his own life. That's just too much. Who gives their life for a bunch of sheep? So yeah. When the wolf comes, he runs, absolutely. The cost for continuing with those sheep when the wolf comes is too high. And I'm telling you this, that this dynamic, cost and benefit, is situation normal in 99.9% .9 of all relationships. <laughs> Even the most cherished and important. If the benefits coming from the relationship get too low or the cost of being in the relationship gets too high, the relationship splits. You quit the job. You leave your spouse. Whatever. The math no longer works. One or both parties run like the hired man. It's called normal. Now, as a point of information, Jesus tells us he says, but that's not how I am. I know that's like totally normal. It's not how I am. It's not how I am with my sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. And I don't do that because I got cornered and there was no escape, so I had to lay down my life. No, in verse 18 he says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And this makes Jesus unique and the greatest shepherd of all time, the greatest possible shepherd in the Bible. Jacob, you heard that name before? Jacob, big, big character in the Bible. But anyway, he was an expert. He was a shepherd, an expert at raising flocks. Uh, and he told his father-in-law Laban that if he lost any of his flock, he would replace them at his own expense. But he doesn't say he'll die for the sheep. And David, we're told, was a great shepherd. And when a lion or a bear came and took away some sheep, he followed them, tracked them down, and killed them, the lion and the bear. He was willing to risk his life for the sheep. But do you think he would have gone if he had known that the only way to get those sheep back was, in fact, to forfeit his life? No. Great shepherds, fine shepherds. But they don't die for the sheep. The uniqueness of Jesus Christ as a shepherd is that he lays down his life for the sheep and he lays it down voluntarily. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. This charge I have received from my father. 
So this was no suicide. Jesus was fulfilling an assignment he had from his father, and he did it willingly. I want to talk about death. Death is an executioner. Death is an enemy. And death has a claim, but only on a sinner. That's the only person death has a claim on. Now what's a sinner? A sinner, by the Bible's definition, is anybody who claims the right over his or her own life. Anybody who claims the right over his or her own life, that's a sinner. Anybody who says, I ought to be the one in charge. I should be the one making the decisions here. I should be the one who decides where I go and what I do and what I'm living for. I should be in charge. In short, you're saying, I'm God. I'm taking charge. Yeah, I didn't create myself. Yeah, I don't own myself. But I'm taking the role of God anyway. Deciding my own right, my own wrong, etc. That's what a sinner is. And death has a claim on anyone who has set themselves up as an alternative to God. There's only one God, there's only going to be one God. And death has been unleashed as a black hooded executioner to rid the world of God usurpers, also called sinners. And you and I are sinners. Therefore, death is our executioner. Death is our enemy. That's what the Bible says. And I hope you realize when I say that, that that is very different from what you're going to hear if you take practically any class, if you were ever to do such a thing, on the subject of death. The modern secular understanding of death and also the Eastern mystical understanding of death is that death is natural. Uh, death is nothing to fear. Well, you know darn well that's not true. Whenever you are in the presence of death, you know that an enemy has been here. An enemy. You know that there's nothing natural about it. It's a monstrosity. It's a perversion of what should be. Why is my mother dead? This should not be. The Bible is consonant with your intuition about death. That death is an enemy and death's out to get me. So how are we then going to meet this black hooded executioner? The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ has gone in before us. Now, when death meets anybody else but Jesus, we're his victim. But the Bible says here, though, that Jesus was not death's victim. Jesus was not death's victim. Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. This is critical to understand. Death had no, he's got, death's got a claim on you and me because we're sinners. Death had no claim on Jesus. Jesus did not have to die. He was under no sentence. Why not? Because he loved the Lord with all his heart and all his mind and all his soul and all his strength and he loved his neighbor as himself just as we're all supposed to. In short, Jesus was no sinner. Thus, death had no claim on him at all. So he says, no one takes my life from me. And he adds, but I lay it down of my own accord. At the end of his life, Jesus walked into our execution room. And he experienced death just like any other human would experience it. Death, what is death? Death is the traumatic separation of the body from the soul. Two things that were created to remain together are in death ripped apart. Death is the most traumatic experience possible, but it had no claim on Christ. Death could not come to Christ. Christ came to death. He walked into our execution room and he voluntarily let himself be ripped apart, body from soul, for our sake. Oh shepherd. Would you really do that for us? Yes my child. Of my own accord. But there is more. There is also spiritual death. I haven't talked about that yet. There is also spiritual death. You know what that means? 
The soul is created by God and is meant to always be with God. That's called spiritual life. Spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God. When Adam and Eve sinned, physical death did not come to them immediately. They still had lots of years. But spiritual death did come to them immediately. The moment they sinned, they were instantly separated from God. That was bad. You can read about it in Genesis 3. But it can get much worse. Because if a person who is walking around, they're physically still breathing, but they're spiritually dead, soul separated from God, if they are not restored to God and their body dies, they enter into eternal death the eternal misery and despair of being forever apart from God. Spiritual death plus physical death brings on eternal death. Now, Jesus went around always in the greatest possible spiritual intimacy with God, spiritual life. He says, I am the life. This is why he said it. But when he went physically to the cross, he voluntarily experienced not only physical death, but spiritual death as well. Yeah, both physical and spiritual death. And thus also eternal death. Yeah. That, that's why those astonishing words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The magnitude of what Jesus went through cannot be comprehended. Somehow he was going through eternal death. He was utterly cut off from God. That was a pain, misery, and despair so great that physical death, the nails and all that, merely a hint of what he was actually going through in total. And this he did of his own accord. Death did not come to him. It had no claim on him. He went to death. He went to our execution room. He endured physically the death that all people will go through, but also voluntarily endured spiritual and eternal death, which as sinners we deserve, but we need never go through it. Not spiritual and eternal death. We need never go through that. Why not? Because the shepherd laid down his life physically and spiritually for his sheep in our place. He had no sins to pay for. So with his life, he paid for ours. Mm. And the shepherd, because he's died blamelessly without any claims on him and has done this for his sheep, has therefore vanquished death and has broken all its claims on us. He has fulfilled all the requirements for his flock and now death has no more claim on his people. He died for them claims of death are over. Oh, shepherd, would you do that for us? Gladly. Of my own accord. That's what this is saying to us. And there's nobody else who will do this for you. Many of us have spent the larger part of our lives looking for somebody. Some of you may think you found somebody. Listen, there is nobody who will do this for you. This self-giving, nobody but Jesus. Nobody else can be this kind of shepherd for you. Let's look at verse 16. I'm going to finish by looking at verse 16. Jesus says there, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. What's this telling us? That the good shepherd is not only totally committed to us, total self-giving, but is also totally committed to unbelievers currently outside his flock. He must bring them, he says. Now how does that happen? Like how does that happen today? Well, since death had no claim on Jesus, it also could not hold him in the grave. He, he rose from the dead. Of course he did. But death couldn't hold him. And he's alive right now. He's alive and active in the world right around us, seeking and bringing other sheep. And his desire and plan is that we who have received him, 
and who have received so much else from him would join him in his mission of bringing other sheep who are not currently of this fold. While we were away on vacation last week, my daughter Martha also took a week's vacation, leaving her apartment in Brooklyn and staying out here on Long Island. In fact, she stayed in our empty house, empty except for the cat. And she had four or five of her girlfriends from Brooklyn also come out and spend a few days here. They drank half my wine, half my beer, and burned half my firewood. <laughs> but I'm actually very glad that they were here. One night, one of the girls said, hey, can we see the church? Of course they could. Martha brought them over. When they got into the sanctuary, when they got in here, something strange happened. Martha says, they all fell silent. One girl started to cry. Another said, I've never felt so forgiven. Now these are young women who never ever go to church. Like, it's been years, if ever, and know almost nothing about real Christianity. What was going on? I'll tell you what was going on. This, this was a strange thing, and I'll tell you what was going on. The risen Lord Jesus was awakening their hearts. There was a supernatural thing that was happening. My question is, what should happen next? What could happen? Well, Martha could just say, well, that was weird, made for a good story, and move on. But her own idea is, I should start an alpha course back in Brooklyn in my apartment. Huh. Now, if you don't know what the alpha course is, it's a series of 10 evenings. When you come together, first you have a dinner together, then you hear an excellent video talk about Jesus, and then you discuss it. Now, will Martha do this in her own apartment and invite those gals? Well, if, she has the, if she's let the love and the life of the Good Shepherd build into her heart, then she will. If not, she won't. When you have Jesus as your shepherd, when you actually let him shepherd you, not just not just the lyric in a church song, but when you actually let him shepherd you and build into your heart, he changes you. Over time, Jesus turns his sheep into shepherds who join him in seeking the lost. You say, come on. Normal Christians cannot be expected to open their house or apartment to an alpha course. Mike Wheeler did. If you don't know, Mike, he's the one who built our new bathrooms. Last winter, we ran 10 weeks of Alpha out of his house. It was great. Elizabeth Lack did. She is a shy German lady at my old congregation in Toronto. Because she's shy and because of her thick accent, she didn't think she could do anything personally to reach the lost. And then she found out that every Alpha course needs a cook. She and her husband, Hubert, opened up their house and cooked a beautiful German meal for 20 people every Wednesday night for 10 weeks. Roladen, red cabbage, it's fantastic. One man who came to faith at the Lax house, John Marshall, went on to become a pastor and a counselor. He came to faith at that Lax house. The purpose of Christianity and of this church is not to confirm people as hired men or women who live their life merely on a transactional cost-benefit basis and think of the church as though it was their club. No, Jesus has got us here to become more and more like him, loving others, sacrificing for others, and joining with him in seeking and loving unchurched, unbelieving people. Why should they die when Jesus has provided life? If we feel personally Honestly, like our own hearts are far from seriously contributing to that. We can turn to our good shepherd for forgiveness. It's a heart problem. We can turn to him for forgiveness and we'll personally receive it. Then we can follow him. He said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. Amen.
Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen. Can you please rise. Let's confess our faith tonight using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The prayer of the church today, we have many people to pray for this week. John Gobler's sister, <coughs> Judy Height. Robert Smith, father-in-law of Bob Yazzo's sister. Eric Johansson's mom. Ruth Johnson and Judy Azario, hospitalized for treatment and recovery. And Herb Peterson, now recovering at home. Those remembering Fred Hartman, whose memorial service was last week, Craig Ria's friend, Jamie Bean, and her family, and especially son William, struggling with her divorce, and Craig's cousin, Paige F File, who suffered broken bones from being thrown from a horse. Deacon Kathy Cordelou, as she continues to battle cancer, and Eric Lawson's cousin, Chase Wallace, recovering from two fractured vertebrae. Eric Herschel, under treatment for pneumonia, and her daughter-in-law, Elaine, being treated for eye issues. For the whole church of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs, let us bow our heads together in prayer. O oh God, show the light of your word to, to those in darkness, that they would know salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We, we celebrate ongoing partnership and ministry at Resurrection and St. John's Lutheran Church in Flushing. Thank you for their cooperative efforts to bring hope and healing to their community. And for the parishioners who have continued to support kingdom work with their financial gifts and by offering themselves in ministry during these difficult times. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all Christian homes, families, and parents. Hear us as we celebrate the birth of a new grandson to Linda and Bob Pennington, Dominic Davis Canada, born April 17th to daughter Jackie and her husband Dave. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. O oh God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, hear our praise for all in need. Judy, Robert, Ruth, Judy, and Herb, the family and friends of Fred, Jamie and her family, especially William Page, Deacon Kathy, Chase, Ellie, Elaine, and all those who we now name before you, in voice or in silence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless those nourished by your holy meal this day. Give joy to the midst of sorrow, the renewal of repentance, and the firm faith cleanse them from evil. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant that we would overcome all evil and patient hope and at, and at last obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In this ongoing COVID time, we don't pass the plates. Instead, I come out and make a little speech every Sunday. But, uh, but no, we still, even though we're not passing the plates, we still offering. It's just what Christians do. Father gives his son to us. Son gives his life, gives the spirit. We give. Um, but there's ways to do it out on the narthex or electronically somehow. But we will, um, 
raise an offering prayer. It's printed in the bulletin at this time. Your son made himself known, O Father. We offer you our gifts. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in the prayer Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Praise Praise Jesus. Jesus.